Good morning. I'd like to start uh, today's activities with uh, Master Sergeant Charles Phillips, the uh, chaplain of the uh, police department, to deliver the invocation. Would everybody please stand? Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather here in this place to conduct the business of this city. I would ask today for a special blessing for our city officials and this assembled council. Father, I would ask that you would graciously grant these men and women the wisdom to lead in the midst of conflicting interests and issues, the confidence in knowing what is right and good, and the ability to work together in harmony. Father, give us the assurance of what would please you and would benefit all of those who live in our city. Thank you for the incredible blessings you've bestowed upon our community, and we would ask for continued opportunities to serve and to make this city a better place to call home. And as always, Father, I would ask that you grant us personal peace in our lives and joy in our tasks as we continue to serve you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to have Councilman Pettis lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Councilman? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First on our agenda, uh, we have a proclamation for Public Works. If the Public Works folks would come forward and meet me down. Great. Greetings, y'all. We have a proclamation that we'd like to present to Public Works, and I'd like the clerk to read it, please. Whereas Public Works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of Public Works systems and programs, such as water, sewers, streets, bridges, traffic, drainage, public buildings, and solid waste collection. Whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services. Whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction, is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials. Whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public work departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim May 17th through 23rd, 2015, as National Public Works Week in Oklahoma City, and he calls upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions of public work officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Thank you. Let's hear some appreciation for public works. We have with us the director of public works, Eric Winger, and I'd like him to say a few words and introduce his staff. And you all are only as good as your last pothole you got filled, aren't you, Eric? We are. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, our appreciation goes out. It is National Public Works Week. Um, and Public Works, I think, is a lot bigger than just the Public Works Department. We also need to recognize your Utilities Department, which is, of course, a lot of our water, sewer, and solid waste services. Our Parks Department, that takes care of a lot of our parks and rec and, and, of course, facilities. Then also Building Management, who helps make sure that all of our public facilities are, are well maintained. And so go, my heart goes out to those directors that assist us every day in making Public Works the best that it can be. But uh, this year's theme is Community Begins Here for Public Works. And so as we look at Public Works and the support of everyday life and the quality of, of life that we have in Oklahoma City, our appreciation to, uh, to you and the Council. I have our staff here. We also have American Public Works Association representatives, but Debbie Miller is our Assistant City Engineer, and then Christy Wall with, with American Public Works Association and the Public Works Department, and Paul Reichbost also with C.H. Guernsey and Company, a supporter of, of Public Works. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Next on our agenda, we have two appointments. A motion a second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. So done. Next on our agenda is the Journal of Council Proceedings. To receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for May 5th and 12th, and to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings on April 28th, 2015. Any discussion? And is so done. Request for uncontested continuances, Mr. City Manager. Mayor, uh, several this morning, starting on page 10, it's listed, but what we're going to mention again is that the uh, uh, ordinance on, on the Yukon annexation will be deferred until June 16th. That's item 7U. And then moving to page 21, under item 9D1, item F 424, Southeast 16th Street. The rest of that be stricken. There's a new owner. Moving to page 22, under item 9E1, 5308 Bodine. Ask that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item J, 2138 Northwest 16th. Ask that that be stricken. The owner has removed. Item K, 2542 Northwest 23rd Street. Ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item L, 2100 Northwest 27th Street. Ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item Q, 2201 Southeast 56th Street. Rest of that be stricken. Um, recent storm damage, we're going to monitor that for a rework. And then item S, 8709 Northwest 86th Street. Rest of that be stricken. The owner has secured. And moving on to item 9F1 on page 23. Item A, 5308 Bodine. Rest of that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item M, 424 Southeast 16th Street, where should that be stricken? There's a new owner. Item N, 2138 Northwest 16th Street, where should that be stricken? The owner has removed. Item P, 2542 Northwest 23rd Street, where should that be stricken? The owner has secured. Item R, 2100 Northwest 27th Street, where should that be stricken? The owner has secured. Item X, 2201 Southeast 56th Street, where should that be stricken? Uh, again, that's uh, from recent storm damage, and we're going to monitor that for a rework. And finally, item Z, 8709 Northwest 86th Place. Where should that be stricken? The owner has secured. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a number of revocable permits. Uh, first revocable permit on our agenda, Action Zone LLC. Anyone here from Action Zone LLC? Seeing them, that's Ward 7, sir. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move for approval. Second. Any discussion? And it is approved. Next on the agenda, Perry Publishing. If you would, as you all come forward, give your name and your, your address, and then uh, talk about your, your event. My name is Connie Neal with Perry Publishing and Broadcasting, 1425 Northeast 23rd Street. And we're doing a Juneteenth celebration at Washington Park. This is our sixth year doing it, the fourth year at the park. Um, it's fun, food, and music. Um, been a great success for the last couple of years and trying to continue that success. Thank you, sir. Ward 7, Councilman. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you uh, tell us on what time that uh, the Juneteenth celebration begins. It starts at 10 o'clock over at 6 o'clock. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I had the opportunity uh, the last several years to attend. Uh, several thousand of people uh, from the community uh, attend the event, and it has been a definitely a great uh, success. So with that said, I move for approval. A motion to second. Please cast your votes. Thank you, thank sir. You. Good luck to you. Next up, we have a revocable permit for City Slide LLC. And uh, that's in Ward 6, Meg. Well, I'm surprised that nobody's here to talk about this event. Drew, do you want to come tell us a little bit about it? This is a new to Oklahoma City event. Uh, it's something that's traveled around the country. And yes, it's a 1,000 foot slip and slide. <laughs> um, it would be set up between. Uh, it would be on Chartel Avenue between Northwest 9th Street and Northwest 5th. Uh, they tell me they can get about 6,000 people uh, to slide the slide. There's tickets for unlimited slides and, and a pair of slides and one, uh, one slide. 
Um, and also they're donating to a local charity. This year they told me it's uh, Cystic uh, Fibrosis Foundation. So I'm sure there's some council members that want unlimited there any truth slide that the, opportunities. <laughs> is there any truth that the uh, councilwoman from Ward 6 is going to throw out the opening slides? <laughs> I've heard the same rumors. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we want to go there. <laughs> anyway, it sounds like a lot of fun, and I was glad to see that water control, and it sounds like a very sophisticated Yes, uh, all the or all the storm drains will be covered. Um, the water actually will be brought in, will be not be taken from our hydrants that will be brought in on trucks and then cycles through the whole time it's treated um, and then they'll be taking it to dispose of it the right way. Well. Great. And do you know what the hours are? I don't remember. I want to say that it begins at uh, uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturday, July 24th. So I encourage everybody to come down and uh, try something new. It's the, like snow tubing for the summer, I the guess. the first, first type of, of this event that we've had so far, but they're getting very popular around the country and we, we see them on social media a lot. Great. Well, I move approval. Second. Please cast your votes. Thank you. Good luck. Next up, uh, DNA Racing. Chad Hodges is here. Uh, Chad Hodges, uh, 2908 Woodstock Road, Moore, Oklahoma. Uh, we're presenting the Oklahoma City Pro-Am Classic. This will be our fourth year. It's a three-day cycling event uh, that would take place in Midtown, Domero, and Automobile Alley. So Chad, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this has grown over the years for the fourth year. I think some of the council may remember, I think the first year we started out with just one day mm -hmm. event and your hope was to grow it into a three day. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, we've seen participant numbers grow, spectator numbers grow. Our hope is uh, for the fifth year to be able to get it on the national criterium calendar, which would then uh, professional cyclists would have to come to Oklahoma City to race because they get points for hitting that level of race. Uh, so we think this year will will give us the credentials to get on that calendar. Great. And just for those watching, the Friday race is during H&H, &H, so it's a really neat combination, and I appreciate your working with uh, the folks at H&H &H to, to make this work. And again, our staff did a fantastic job um, coordinating all of these moving pieces. So yeah, I move great. approval. Second. Motion to second, and it is approved. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming down. Next we have... Uh, Kathy's Market, we have a representative, Craig Travis. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm uh, Craig Travis, uh, 3004 Paseo Street. This will be our 13th year for Kathy's Market in the Paseo. Uh, Saturday, the 23rd, 24th, 25th, um, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we'd just like to see you all there. That's in Ward 2, Councilman Shadeen. Motion to second. And you are approved. Good luck. Thank you for coming down. Red Earth, Incorp Red Earth Incorporated, we have Eric Osh. Good morning. I'm here to tell you about the Red Earth Festival, which is going to be June 5, 6, and 7. We're going to kick it off with a parade through the streets of downtown Oklahoma City. We'll circle the Myriad Botanical Garden starting at 10 a.m. and uh, expect several hundred entries in our parade and several thousand people to line the streets for the parade. Um, the, when we have the Red Earth Festival, Oklahoma City becomes the center of Native American art and culture in America and draw people from all over the world. Thank you, sir. That's in Ward 6 and 7. Motion to second. Please guess votes. You are approved. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Last revocable permit on our agenda, Uptown 23rd District. Anyone here from the Uptown 23rd District? Uh, that's in Ward 2 also, Councilman Shadeen. Motion to second. And it is approved. Let's recess the council meeting. Convene is the Oklahoma City Municipal uh, Facilities Authority. Six items. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And it is so approved. Adjourn the OCMFA, uh, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, and five items. The motion is second. Larry, I did, if I could just make a comment, item C, I am really happy, manager, to see the final acceptance of those ADA projects out at the fairgrounds. It's been a long process and a long time coming, and I think this closes out all of those things that needed to be done by agreement. That's correct. Good. Thank you very much.
Any other comments or discussion? I, I have a question, and I should know the answer to this, <clears throat> but, but I don't. Um, what are the water charges to the golf system? What do they pay? They, they pay just regular rates based on capacity, or they give a discount? Uh, a while back, uh, they weren't paying their full administrative charges back to the city, so we did this annual. I wanted to make it permanent. The Golf Commission chose to make it an annual event to, to, to put this on so we can get the administrative fees, so, so we can get the charges back for retiree health insurance and administrative costs that we have, and, and, and uh, the water is a part of that. So they, 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 pay, they pay for, for parts of their water. So, so they, the, water, the courses pay the same amount per water as an individual, would, based on the right rate chart, I understand it has to do with volume. But. Um, the city pays the water trust full rate for it. I'm not sure because of the fluctuation of, of revenues between the Golf Commission that the Golf Commission uh, actually pays 100% of all their charges with water and you know, they pay a lump sum that, that goes toward that. the administrative charges and the water, and, and I don't think it pays for all of it. But the city pays the water trust for all of it. Uh, right. And, and it's, it, it, as you well know, that, that it's, it, they pay full fare for the water for all the courses. It's at Hefner, but Hefner, they use raw water on the lake, so there's a raw water rate that's not the same as finished right. water. Right. It, it's subsidized by the city. And the city pays for the water, not the... Um, again, there, there's, there's the water charges and some of the administrative charges, and, and, and they pay a lump sum toward that, so they pay part of the water. It, it, it's how I look at it, but yes, there, there's a gap there. Do you have a sense of how much water is being used? Oh, yeah, we know exactly how much water is being used. I get back to you on that if you want. There's good records on that, obviously. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, cast your votes, and the uh, PPA is approved. Uh, adjourn the Oklahoma City PPA. It convenes the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, and there are three items on the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the, uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, the uh, item two, the budget, be deferred for a week, or two weeks, actually. Um, because we haven't presented that to you yet, <laughs> and Marsha will present that as a part of the utilities departmental presentation next week, and then we're going to approve it the following. So we just kind of got the cart a little bit ahead of the horse on, uh, on this one. And so I'd ask that that be deferred two weeks until June 2nd, so you have the opportunity to hear the budget presentation on it next week. We have a motion for deferral. Do we have a second? Second. Please cast your votes. And item B is deferred two weeks. So now we have two item, uh, one item left on the, two items left on the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. The motion is second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And the OCEAT is approved. Uh, we're going to adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene as the council meeting with a consent docket. No second. Are there any individual considerations? Mr. Mayor, 7AG. 7AG. Thank you, John. And Mr. Mayor, I had several. Um, 7P, 7Q, 7T, and 7BC. Uh, okay. V5. B5? V is in V5. V5? Yeah. Any more? Just want to, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, I want to point out that we do have a couple of presentations uh, this morning on AK and AL. Uh, AK is the Capitol Hill Library, and AL is the uh, tennis improvements. Okay, let's take the uh, considerations from Council. Uh, first off, John. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this question relates to the timeline uh, for the project on Northwestern. Uh, this is actually shared by Ward uh, 7 and Ward uh, 8. And so I just wanted to update because Mark and I have been getting calls in reference to this project. So I just wanted to get a quick update. Thank you, Mr. Councilman. So we do have work that is occurring on Northwestern Avenue from Northwest 164th to Northwest 178th. 
And work has been underway for quite some time. And I think one of the things that maybe our residents may not realize is that the work is actually more than just a road widening project. Um, there's actually a lot of utility work. There was a bridge replacement and a bridge widening as well. So all the work that's been seen today was really relocating, constructing two new very large sanitary sewer lines and two water lines and also the bridge widening, um, which has taken more than a year now to actually get all of those ready for the road reconstruction. Now, the weather's delayed us slightly, but the road work actually began last week, and it's proceeding. The project overall is going to be completed in November of this year. Um, it's a four-lane widening of that existing roadway. So if you were to look at the timeline and just some milestones going forward this summer, uh, they're starting on the east side of Western, starting at 164th and moving north, and that work is actually scheduled to be completed um, in June, the, uh, June and July. They'll move to the west side in July and August. There's some sidewalks that will then be completed in September. Um, the sod will be one of the final things in October, and then we'll be able to punch and finalize the entire project no later than November. Now, we have seen a lot of out-of-the-ordinary weather this month, and so there are some days or possibly some weeks, but, uh, but again, we're looking to finish the project by the end of the year. Appreciate the continued patience with just a complicated project. So I'm not complaining about the rain. We, we love the rain, but it's realistic to tell our constituents that this will be finished by the end of the year? Yes. Okay. You know, we also have received a few complaints about the detour road that's in place. Um, it is a detour. It's not intended to last for years and years, but there is some maintenance that is required, and we have directed the contractor to make those immediate repairs. Just like our other city streets, it's also starting to collect a few potholes, but we're getting that contractor out there to make sure that the roadway is safe. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Salyer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, item 7P, I just wanted to um, be sure that the public was aware uh, that this is a call to artists for the public art for the interior of our new police headquarters um, under the city's 1% ordinance. We have a budget for the interior uh, work to um, not exceed $40,000. Item Q um, is... I, I had a question on that one, yeah. actually, too, because I thought that we'd already used that, um, the 1% for the outside, the, the, mon the monument, or the 1%, the 1 will be split into two projects, the outside oh, okay. project and an inside project. Okay, that makes sense. I was going to say, Robbie's here if we need any clarification, but the, I think the major piece was the outside piece, and then this uh, second uh, allocation is for a smaller piece inside. Um, item uh, 7Q is a professional services agreement with um, our friends at IQC again, and I just wanted to thank them for the work that they're doing um, on Classen, um, south of 23rd Street. Um, citizens group got together and had some issues with crossing the street and street timing signals, and um, this has turned into a, a much more substantial project. Uh, I think they've been doing great work, and so I wanted to um, thank them for participating with us again and working with our planning department. Here doing a great job. Item uh, T is our annual uh, continuum of care renewal grant, and I just wanted to um, mention the dollar amounts because it really is significant. This is uh, $2 million six of federal funding coming to us to help um, uh, work with our social service agencies. Um, it's no city match is required for these dollars, so this is a direct pass through. But the agencies, um, you know, that we work with are doing such terrific work, and uh, we're really seeing good results. I think in um, helping to house the homeless and, and provide services. And so I just wanted to mention um, this grant uh, reaches out to the Homeless Alliance, Hope Community Service, Red Rock Behavioral Health, City Care, Oklahoma City Metro Alliance, Community Health Centers, uh, and Heartline amongst uh, some others. Uh, these agencies all are the partners that provide the services in the gaps that we have difficulty filling out of our general fund. And so I always like to mention that. And then the last thing, uh, Pete, this is for Ward 4 and Ward 6. We're getting maps three sidewalks uh, in a number of places in South Oklahoma City. So I just wanted the citizens to know we're working on north side of Southwest 44th between South Penn and Black Elder. East side of Southwestern between 59th and 44th, north side of Southwest 44th between May and South Penn, and the east side of South Penn between Southwest 44th and Southwest 59th. And those are all maps three sidewalks. Thank you, Mr. Vice Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, may I uh, go back to item Q uh, for just a quick comment? Um, Councilwoman Salyer and I had the opportunity 
to attend the uh, board meeting of ULI last Friday, and then I also got to attend a meeting Saturday focusing on bicycling here in Oklahoma City. And so this study uh, along Class and Boulevard hopefully will help identify ways to improve all sorts of transportation, pedestrian as well as cycling. And this is kind of directed towards Jim. Jim, perhaps we could even extend something like this. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, in general uh, it's a safe environment to ride your bicycle in Oklahoma City on most major streets. I know we've done a lot in the downtown area to provide bike lanes. I'm still not convinced, uh, or I still lack a little bit of confidence, I guess. So uh, perhaps this study will help us to see that if we could enhance those bike lanes by putting in those plastic uh, sticks, I don't know the technical term, you know, to help provide even greater separation. And then uh, one thing, one of the uh, speakers at the ULI event over the weekend was Jeff Riz, Rizm. He's with an uh, international architect firm. And he focused on uh, the idea of planning or testing when they have new ideas. Like he gave an example that his group worked on closing uh, Times Square, I'm sorry, in New York City. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, concern prior to that. But then they tested it. It did quite well. And now everybody's extremely pleased with the idea of closing Times Square. So with the idea of testing and improving our city for bicycling, perhaps we could do a study or have a, uh, a test to where we would close one of the lanes, like on May Avenue, from Early Wine Park to get us down to downtown. And I was thinking, you know, you could close one of the four lanes along May Avenue starting at 119th Street and go north all the way to Grand Boulevard. And then we already have the sidewalk throughout the median on Grand Boulevard that would get you from May to Walker. And then it would require closing one of the four lanes on Walker at 36th Street all the way into uh, downtown. But to try that for a couple of months, you know, Mainly with, with this information in mind, certainly weekend automobile traffic is much less than during the uh, work week. And then secondly, there would probably be more individuals able to ride their bicycles for an extended period of time. I could ride to work on Saturday and back if we closed that one lane, say, from like 7 in the morning to like 5 in the evening. But it would just be used as a test uh, to see how much additional bicycling occurs if we make a commitment to something like that? Just um, a thought. Yeah, no, we'll to look into that. Okay, thank you. Mayor, <clears throat> uh, I have a thought about bicycling, and I think it has actually, if anybody's been to any big city, is it safe to ride a bicycle anywhere? I mean, I've been to New York City, I've been to city, all, I mean, from somebody from South Oklahoma City, it's a big deal to have been to New York City. I suspect the rest of you have been there a lot of times. But uh, um, I never thought it's safe to ride a bicycle anywhere. You look at, look at the way bicycle riders do in New York City, they're in and out of traffic. The difference is the bicyclists and the motorists all have some appreciation for the situation that they're in. I think in Oklahoma City the problem is neither the bicyclist or the motorist have any appreciation for it. I think they don't. They just don't uh, have the same courtesy to one another that they do in, in big cities. We can make all kinds of rules and lanes and stuff, but until people, till drivers start respecting bicycle riders and bicycle riders start respecting drivers, I don't think we're going to accomplish much. I think it's an attitude thing a whole lot more than it is a Pete, I think that public works thing. of yours is very important that there needs to be a much greater respect between the two groups, the automobiles and, and the uh, bicyclists. But there are other communities uh, who have gone to great lengths to improve the safety of bicycling. Yeah. For example, uh, Minneapolis has done a great job of providing 
some very long, in-depth uh, bicyc bicycling trails. And I'm saying... But they, do, but they do it by separating the cyclists from the street. And that's what I'm suggesting. Right. Until we find a way to get the bicyclists off the streets, let's provide the best alternative, and that's to provide a dedicated lane of traffic for the bicyclists. I think that, I mean, if you're going to look to New York in that lesson, the lesson from New York was not just to put paint on the street and give them their own dedicated lane. It was to go to what Pete's saying. You have to have physical separation, and I think you were saying this also. Yeah. You have to put parallel parking uh, in the middle of the street and then put the bikes on the other so you have the cars protecting the bikes from the moving traffic. Or New York is actually putting concrete in the street uh, to separate the bike lane. For, it's not enough to just have a white line that has a, a picture of a bike, but actually put concrete, make investments in your bond and your street improvements to physically separate the cars from the bike lane. Right. And again, the only reason why I'm bringing this up is just to uh, continue the idea of testing ideas. And this would be an opportunity to test. And we may find nobody has an interest in going from far southwest Oklahoma City to downtown. I think there is an interest in doing that. And perhaps some people don't need that additional level of safety to do that. But people like me, I do. I, th I think the other, the other thing that, I mean, the weather has to be right do that. And so that's why if we're going to dedicate whole lanes to bikes, I feel like that isn't probably the most efficient thing to do whenever for a big chunk of the year in Oklahoma City, people aren't going to ride their bikes uh, to work. People so. in Minneapolis is one of the, the largest bike riding cities in the country and the, the weather is abysmal. It's horrible. But they ride bikes all the time. Yeah. Okay. Special. Thank, thank you all. <laughs> yeah. uh, citizens who, who may be uh, watching this and want, want to put some input in, uh, there is a, a Trails Advisory Committee which deals with bike uh, issues, and uh, I'd encourage you to look that up and, and come. It meets uh, once a quarter at the Will Rogers Park, and there's an effort of, uh, also for there's a not city manager to uh, increase the uh, recognition of biking in Oklahoma City and get a, a higher award for the condition of our biking. There is, and, and, and always in the audience, but the, the planning department is, is pursuing updating the, the, the biking uh, segment of, the, of our comprehensive plan to take a look at, at the, uh, uh, that, a very broad look at, at, at all aspects of biking. And so, I mean, we do have one individual who wants to be able to bike from South Oklahoma City to downtown, <laughs> right? So we can put that down and we can definitely count that. Moving on, Councilman Greiner. Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight a, uh, a street resurfacing project that's also a, uh, also a bike lane. Um, South Lake Hefner Drive. Um, it is about just under three lane miles. Uh, it's going to cost about five hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty thousand of that uh, will be paid by ODOT. So I hear a lot of, I've heard a lot of people that live in this area that um, say that the street is horrible, and so it's good to see that it's being resurfaced. Thank you, sir. Uh, are we? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I had another topic. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, there's an item. There's an item on the agenda today. Um, concerning the plans and specifications for the Oliver Park uh, detention facility at 29th and uh, I think that's Draper Park, not Oliver Park, but uh, um, at 29th and Santa Fe. Um, you know, the uh, all the flood control measures that have been put in on Lightning Creek over the last uh, 40 years don't work. I mean, Unless we have a 500-year flood once a month, we're still getting flooding in people's homes. We're still getting flooding in, uh, in the, that park facility filled up, almost to the point where it got into homes uh, that were left after we took about a dozen homes or so a few years ago. Um, I wonder if we, if our calculations, if there's something, either 500-year floods occur more often than I 
than you'd think based on how long 500 years is, and certainly 100-year floods occur more often, or they have in the last few years. And um, I, I, will, I really worry about the fact that we spent millions of dollars on the Lightning Creek improvements in South Oklahoma City, and it's an abysmal failure. I mean, it, if it was calculated to keep water out of people's houses, it's not doing it. This last time, I went to home after home after home that had water in it. Backyards water within a few feet of houses. I mean, deep water, four or five feet deep in people's yards. Um, I don't know what the answer is. We built those big detention facilities on all the little outlets of Lightning Creek, one on Santa Fe, one on Western. They're not little, they're huge detention facilities. They don't seem to slow the water up enough to keep it from backing up into people's houses. I, I wonder if, a, if a, this, what this 2007 thing, a bond issue thing, is going to do that the last 40 years of bond issues hasn't done. It's a lot of money, and if it's not going to work, I, I think we ought to go back to drawing board. Yeah, in drainage improvements, there are no absolutes. They're, di they're designed over problematic, probable uh, rainfall events that come down the line. In the last three years, we've had Eric, help me out. Two, two, two hundreds and a five hundred, and and so yeah, that has not been the, the, the standard. But if those improvements had not been in, the flooding would have been tremendously worse than what occurred over there. And yes, there are still some problems there. I, I understand well, that, Councilman. I've been down there. I've seen them. I, I know. I know the areas you're talking about. But, 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 I really they probably would have been worse. Oh. But I've never seen. I I live on. I grew up on Lightning Creek. And I've never seen water higher than it's been now. I mean, after all these improvements, I've still been in situations where I've never seen water before, ever. So to support the city and, managers. And that's, that's not over. I, I can damn near get the 100-year flood deal myself. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I'm, I've been there. I, I've lived there 70, in that area 72 years. And I've never seen it. And I've seen big rains. I've seen all before these improvements were there. But I've never seen it get as high as it is now, this time. After all this money, after all this delays on this project on, on 29th and, and uh, uh, Santa Fe, uh, and the financial reasons for the delays, it's not your fault, but that, that when you do it with bond money, it takes a while to get things done. I understand that. But I'm just, sad, I'm just worried that it isn't going to work when you get it finished. So a couple of comments. I mean, the last five years have been historic for Oklahoma City. There have been three 500-year events in the last five years, and then we've actually had two 100 or plus 100 years in that same five-year period. So that's not normal. And I don't know in our Oklahoma City history that we've had such a short but span of time. Wouldn't that challenge you to go back and look at how you decide that? No, I'm not, yeah. I don't think you're personalized by saying you, let me say we, that, that, we, that we ought to go back and look at that if, you, if you've had that many 500-year events in that short a time? The answer to that is yes, but we did design based upon the, the, the 100 and some years before those events. I understand. The, this is a project that's going forward now. This is what this item is, to go forward with the project now. Based on the information we have now, do you think maybe we ought to look at it again and make sure that we think this money is going to be the best place we can spend the money? The answer is yes, and, and I have a second comment. We are actually working on a potential revision to the drainage ordinance that we'd like to present to the council this summer. We're also looking at updating our design criteria for storms. We agree that something has changed and we're going to need to do something a little bit different. But we also have to make sure that it's manageable but that it makes good engineering logic. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to relook at the storm data. We're going to relook at the recent history that we've had with flooding. And then, yes, we'll reevaluate this project as well. But additional capacity of that pond at 29th and Santa Fe would absolutely help mitigate some future storms. It may not completely eliminate the chance of flooding. If we get another 500-year event, we take on another 6.3 inches in two and a half hours, it's going to flood again. But we've had other areas of the city that had the same results. I mean, that was the heaviest hit. What I'm saying is, if you have three 500-year events in five years, maybe you ought to re maybe we ought to rethink what a 500-year event is. But, I but mean, Pete, I mean, if you start using statistics, you've got to realize that when you roll the dice, every chance it starts it over. It, it's no, a I, unique, no, I, independent I, chance of it I, I understand that, but I. If you were going to, if we're going to redesign this project right now today, 
Would we design it exactly the way it is, or would we take into consideration that we've had three 500-year floods in the last, and maybe that means that 500-year floods, based on what we thought, are not what they really are. Maybe gonna, there may have 500-year flood is bigger than that, or it comes more often than that. Staff's prepared to look at new criteria for this park and reevaluate to make sure that it's the best project for for this pond. Um, but that's going to be for all drainage improvements going forward, not just this one. We're looking at it citywide. But yes, we're committed to this and, and things that would occur after the summer if the council adopts the new drainage ordinance changes and also our design criteria manual. But we want to present you with all of the information and not just one project. What, what do you, give me a, your your your. Uh, expert opinion on what is it, what is what's the what is it is it do 500 year floods occur more often than 500 years do is it is a result of uh, of a lot of development more rooftops more more sidewalks more driveways than we ever thought about no, it's not the it's not the more impervious area that, that isn't the issue the issue is the intensity of the rainfalls it, it's climatological it does it's it's nature it's mother nature and and again it's okay to get six inches of rain we just can't take it in two and a half hours if we got six inches over a week we wouldn't flood the problem was how fast we get the rain and that's hard to control but as a part of detention well, pond design, I, we're going to look at designing new outlets that I will recognize reduce you can't control how much rain you get. You can control how big the ditch you build to carry it out, and that's my, my concern. And this project makes a larger pond to help contain the 100-year and possibly even something above that. Is Without it, this work, it won't. It would not change. But we do need to do this project. Does it do anything to let the water that ponds up out? You know, we've had a situation where the water that ponded up actually went over 29th, went over the top of 29th Street, went through that what looks to be a fairly small outlet in a pretty good-sized pond that we're getting to make big, we're getting ready to make bigger. So, so the outlets are designed to ensure that we do not flood the downstream property owners. So we look at historic data, historic flow rates to make sure that those are controlled. The pond helps us hold that water back to release it more slowly to control that flooding, and this project will take that into account, yes. And you think, that, you think the increase of this, this pond is going to delay the flooding where? I think that we'll see general improvements in the area, but I will just say, if we get another 500-year event, this will not fix that. Well, this is going to fix the for the one. not going to have anything to do with the houses that I saw with water in them. not going to have anything to do with that. Because it's not, it's water that's flooding their house before it gets to the pond. So if the pond was bigger, it wouldn't make any difference because the water's not backing up from the pond into their houses. It's backing, it's overflowing our, our uh, facilities that take water to the pond. So with May 6, one of the things that we also do is we do accurate surveys of all the structural flooding, the houses that flooded. Yes, South Santa Fe from 29th to 44th in this last event was the most significantly hit area of the entire city. We've surveyed that in. We've put that into our, our, our tracking system. We've also visited with homeowners so we could get pictures and, and actually real data. Those are the types of pieces of information we use for the next bond issue when we plan the next project. So in addition to what this project is including, we're already looking at that next project for improvements that will take additional. It may be pipes under the ground. It may be additional pond. It may be possibly the purchase of additional homes that are repetitive loft structures. But I there are homes along Southwest 40th Street, west of, excuse me, east of Walker, south of Cap Hill High School, that have flooded for the last 40 years, and they still flood. All this money that we spent hasn't affected that at all. I mean, their furniture was out in the street last week, and I've seen it out in the street my whole life. And I don't understand why, with all the money that we've spent, we haven't have found some way to fix that. I mean, Pete, we have exactly you know, the all that, that uh, uh, Councilman Bishop, one of my, one of my predecessors, was, was really the architect of some of that Lightning Creek stuff. He, that was his idea to do that. He lives right on Light, Lightning Creek. He got wa there was water in his house last, this last flood. Water over the top of this giant concrete flue into his house. Or his wife's house. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I we may, maybe we're designing it too small. Maybe, may, or maybe it's climate change. Maybe climate change is real, despite what Senator Denhoff says. Maybe it is real. And, Thank and, you. And maybe we're going. We uh, let's, we, uh, Pete, let's. Well, I, I, but I, I want to, I want, I want to, I want to make sure that people understand that. 
that I personally don't think what we're doing is the right thing to do. I don't know what the right thing to do is, so I'm not going to challenge that. But I can tell you, when you just continue to spend money doing things over and over and over and things don't get any better, and I, I would challenge a little bit the fact that it's better. I, because I've seen water, again, places I never saw it before, and I've seen it more than once there. It just, uh, and that's just one, that's just one drainage facility, just one. Can I ask you one question about, of course, climate change is real. The, the na nationally, people seem to be moving towards adaptation to climate change, not necessarily looking at what happened in the last hundred years, but realizing the last hundred years might not be the best blueprint because things are changing. So would there be utility in shortening the duration of what we're looking at? It doesn't make sense to look at tornadoes going through more before more was developed because you didn't have the heat and et cetera. Would it make sense to look at just the rainfall in the last 15, 20 years as opposed to trying to base our planning on the last hundred years because of the idea that things are changing and going forward is going to be different than the last hundred years? So I mentioned the drainage ordinance and it gets the criteria for design, but we have a companion criteria manual that our engineers actually use for the actual designs and the construction of our projects. We're looking at revising both, and the answer is yes. We're looking at the shorter term data, the most recent events, but we're also going to look at new technologies, modern design, looking at other examples to help reduce flooding. So what has been done, say, for the past 25 years, I do suspect that we'll have changes for the next 25. But we're going to continue to collect the data, and the data that we're collecting locally the things that when we're actually going door to door and we're surveying the marks and how high the water was on the wall is going to help those future engineers with those projects to make sure that we're providing the best product. And that's all coming this summer. We're looking to incorporate all of this data for your consideration summer of 15. Yeah. I, I guess my question still is, do you think the best expenditure of this money is to finish a plan we designed eight years ago before this recent statistical anomaly that we are giving, we're still going to have again this afternoon, do you think this is still the best way to spend the money? We're seeing flooding in this area that is for less than a 100-year event. Yes, this is money that needs to be spent to help protect the area for the 100-year event that's our current ordinance. Not doing that will, will, will most likely ensure that we will continue to flood with that lesser storm. My thought is it won't, wouldn't prevent water from being in one home that I saw, not one. Wouldn't prevent, because water didn't get out of that pond and in, into people's homes. Well, no, it didn't. It won't save one additional flooding event if we had the same rain again. That I, can, that I can't see. I mean, I drove both sides of all that. The water that came into people's homes did not come out of the pond into the home. It came from, from floodways that have been in existence my whole life that we've never addressed. I just have some sympathy for somebody that's got their sofas on the, on the, on the sidewalk. And, or no, there's no sidewalks in South Oklahoma City, I'm sorry on the curb, and uh, and they've been paying this drainage fee for a long, long time, and it doesn't seem to have made any difference to them. Councilman Greiner. I'm done. You're done? I'm done, yeah. Okay. I thought you are ready. Uh, we do. We have a couple of reports this morning. We'd like to start with the presentation on, on uh, Capitol Hill Library, and uh, with some Representatives from uh, Guernsey with us this morning, David Ullman and uh, Brian Durbin. Good morning. I'm Brian Durbin with Guernsey. David Ullman with Guernsey. Um, we'd like to present a, a quick slideshow here on uh, the findings and the results of the design effort that we put together on the Capitol Hill Library Renovation Expansion Project. And we're going to discuss three things here. We're going to discuss the scope, the budget, and the schedule. Um, the project scope um, involves three main components. So we've got land acquisition, site development, renovation, expansion of the existing structure, and um, the fourth component is the library fixtures, furnishings, and equipment component. 
Um, item one, the land acquisition involves the acquiring of adjacent sites to the existing facility for the expansion of parking as well as the addition to the existing structure. Um, site development number two is going to be the development and the design of those acquired sites for additional parking um, and a trade-off between the existing bank facility and the library in the city to uh, mitigate parking loss um, as a result of the expansion onto the bank parking area. Um, number three, renovation expansion of the existing structure. We will be doing a significant structural and architectural um, alteration to the existing facility. Um, it is a 1951-era uh, concrete structure and brick masonry building. We're going to be doing a complete gut and retrofit of that entire structure, um, which will include a roughly 9,200 square foot of addition to the east of the existing facility. Um, and the fourth and final component will be a complete interior fit out for fixtures, furnishing, and equipment. Shelving, furniture, all of the equipment that's needed for the proper function of a library. This next slide shows the existing condition of the building. Um, again, it opened in 1951, so you're seeing um, finishes and forms um, that are reminiscent of, of the, the era. Um, exposed concrete structure, um, brick masonry, and conventional glazing. Um, the next slides we're going to look at, you're going to start to see how we are, are, are altering that site in the facility. This is a map of the area. This is the, the north boundary. This is 26th Street. South boundary is uh, 27th Street, and this is Hudson to the west. Here you're seeing the existing structure. Here is the new addition to the building. This is the existing parking lot that is shared by the bank and the library. We are actually going to acquire this site for the addition of the bank, or pardon me, for the addition to the library. And then the project is acquiring this portion of the city block of existing and abandoned home home sites that will then be the new parking facility and area that will be shared by both the library and the bank. This is a preliminary schematic site design for what we're planning on doing with that site. You'll see here you've got the existing library component, the new development or addition component, which sits on that parking area, the existing bank parking to remain. These are the existing old home sites that are being turned into the parking for the new library. This area is going to be uh, redeveloped and then given back to the bank to mitigate the loss of the parking over in this area. So this is going to be bank parking. This will be library parking. Here are some conceptual renderings for what the bank, or pardon me, what the library will look like um, when it is completed. We're actually taking the building and flipping it from an orientation standpoint. The current um, entrance is on the south side, pardon me, on the north side of the building off of 26th Street. We are now moving the entry down to the south side off of 27th Street off of the new parking element. So this top view is looking um, from the 27th Street intersection south, or pardon me, northeast at the new entry element and what the new facade is going to look like. This area over here is the existing structure. The area to the right, that would be showing the, the addition. The second view on the bottom, this is um, on uh, 26th Street looking southwest. To the left here, this would be the parking area that's going to remain for the bank. This element is the addition, the roughly 9,000 square feet addition. This is the existing structure that we are altering. You'll see, you've noticed from the previous images in this one, we're doing a pretty significant alteration in the architectural uh, vocabulary for the building in terms of the style and color and how it's going to start reacting with the community. Um, pretty extensive in terms of the color of brick, the style of the building. Um, but in essence, we've, we've maintained those parts and pieces in the same capacity in terms of its masonry, exposed concrete structure, and, and glazing. 
Here's a floor plan showing the, the planned layout for the space. Um, again, this is the southern new entry, the, the new parking lot just to the south here, um, 26th, 27th Street, and Hudson here to the west. Um, large community space, um, library administrative and functional capacity, and then the rest of it will be the floor for the, for the library's collection, study carrels, study areas, computer, internet access, all of the things that you would find in a current and modern library. Um, <clears throat> recently visiting the library at about 3 o'clock on a Wednesday, the facility as it stands now is jam-packed with um, elementary school kids. So we really see that this is going to be a really nice improvement and advancement for the library in that particular part of town. <clears throat> um, project budget and schedule. <clears throat> the project budget, when the, the, the project uh, first began, was set at just over $4 million. Um, as of right now, at this particular phase, we've just completed the preliminary report phase of the, the design process. We're sitting at roughly three and a half million dollars. <throat> we expect that number to alter a little bit as we get further into design and some of the, stru the structural requirements for the project become more real. Um, but right now we are tracking to be on budget. Um, as far as project schedule is concerned, um, we just wrapped up the preliminary report, which is where we are at this moment in time, um, spring of 2015. Um, the next phase of the project will be final plans and construction award. Um, we have started the process of construction documents and plan on completing and awarding the contract in the fall of 2015. <clears throat> um, we expect for construction to begin shortly after that in the winter of 2015 with roughly a 400, 450 day construction time frame which would put us at completion and FF&E installation in the spring of 2017. I have a couple questions. Sure. One is, do you have a hard copy of that uh, presentation you made? Yeah. I'd like to have one if I could. Absolutely. I don't have to have yours, but I mean... You, you, can, you can have this one. Okay. okay. Actually, it okay. says right on here. But I, I'd like name. to have one. The other concern I have, you mentioned being there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That, that's one of the things, having been there at 3 o'clock, 3.15 in the afternoon, is one of the reasons I've, that I have uh, been a, a strong advocate for expansion of this facility. But the reason that, was, uh, that it's full at 3.30 or 3.15 in the afternoon is because all the children at uh, Capitol Hill Elementary School yes. get out of school. Uh, has any thought been given to making it um, safer for them to get there? I mean, some kind of access across Harvey, um, some kind of access, because it, it, it's going to happen. I mean, that's sure. why they're there, is they come to get out of school, and nobody pick, there's nobody to pick them up. They, they, not, right. they don't go home when they go to school until somebody comes and gets them. I mean, they go to the library until somebody comes and gets them. So they're there from about 3 to about... Some of them are there as late as 5.30. Yeah. Um, and because of the, the schools now keeping the playground area open, it would seem to me there's some likelihood of people continuing to come sure. back and forth there. Has any thought been given to designing it in such a way that that could be safer? While we're sensitive to that, this particular project and the components of it don't specifically address that but we believe that the way we've oriented the building and some of the, the, the functions of it help maybe address some of that to some degree. As far as traffic path and, and, and traffic from the school over, I, I can't say that we specifically address that in terms of a safety factor. Council, that's probably beyond the scope of their, of their I understand, scope, but Eric can certainly look at that. Yeah, I understand, but I, what, I'm gonna, what I was going to say next is I do, I do understand that, but, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me not, not to think about it in the process because that's where those things, I'm saying it again, Arna, the, uh, that's why those kids are there and that's how they get sure. there. So we, we to ignore agree. that on the scope thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I know it's not your job, but... This gentleman right here, and you can get together and talk about it, and you can make it better. Sure. Because it, it is not a good situation. The way the, the back of the school is fenced, there's not a crosswalk there. It just needs to be better. 
Agreed. And let us look at that as another, you know, Ward 4 project that we can start working on and, and not necessarily with the library, but in conjunction with the library. Okay. And, and because of that reason, did, it seems like the parking lot is really big for the, for, you know, I, I could totally understand that the library would get packed, but is the, is, is that too much parking or is it, have you done some sort of study to show oh, that, absolutely. that, I mean, that is the right number of parking? We, we're using the city's required parking oh, okay. ordinance and the, the number of parking stalls is directly related to the square footage and the capacity of the building. Right. And it, it's based on kind of a worst case scenario if the place was absolutely maximum occupied and everybody that was going to be there was in a vehicle. Okay. So, I mean, and it takes into factor, you know, some of those variables, but yes, it, right. the, the parking lot is designed specifically for the purpose of and function of the building. Parking is really a premium in that area, too. The, 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 yes, the, we, we discovered that with right. when, we, when we suggested to take part of the bank's parking. Right. <laughs> Are you going to put in some bike racks? <laughs> Pardon me? Are you putting yes. in some bike racks? Yes. I mean, it, the, the, the idea is that this is going to become an anchor in the community for, obviously for children, especially in the area, but, but for everybody. And the idea, and this ties back to the bicycle component, you know, part of the cultural shift that, that we're, as designers, are trying to help change uh, the idea of how bicycling is. So it, it is a, it's a foregone conclusion and, and a, an absolute that all the buildings that we design, particularly community facilities, all have a biking component built into them just for that purpose. Excuse me, did you mention, uh, is there going to be a new uh, meeting room or community room? There is a meeting community room in the facility. What's the capacity for that? Um, I would have to get that back to you on that. I don't know if, remember off the top of my head. Okay. Well, I think that's an important component. And while meeting rooms... Can you pull that back up for You second? hate to uh, commit that much space to a facility for a meeting room. With a library, you can just move tables in and out and use it as a reading room. And then when it's required yeah, yeah, to be used... If you look right here, I mean, I would say it's 150 people. I mean, it, it's, it's a... It's okay. a I mean, it's, it's roughly the size of this room. Okay. I mean, it, it, it'll... And I believe it can be divided so that it can be two separate rooms. Good. Thank you. You bet. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next presentation is from ADG, and Aaron Danker is here to uh, talk to us about the improvements to the Will Rogers Tennis Center. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, my name is Aaron Dinker. I'm uh, with Architectural Design Group, ADG, and I uh, wanted to talk to you about the uh, uh, the improvements for the Oklahoma City Tennis Center. Um, go to the next slide. The, uh, the project um, scope is really to add outdoor courts uh, to the existing facility, um, and with the increase of those courts, would add uh, more space for uh, the tournaments and events that are currently held at this facility, in addition to youth sized courts to. Uh, work with their youth programs and secondly would be providing a indoor uh, facility that would enclose six courts that would allow tennis play in inclement weather and during the, the winter months so it would increase kind of the, the length of, of uh, times that people could go uh, play tennis at this facility. To give you an idea of the, where the site is located, uh, it's bounded on the west side by North Portland Avenue on the north, uh, northwest 36th Street. Uh, the existing site has uh, 24 full-size uh, uh, tennis courts, um, an existing clubhouse um, to the uh, south and west. And again, all this area is within the Will Rogers Park area. So again, the, the bounding line that you see is really kind of the fence line that separates the the tennis center from the rest of the uh, Will Rogers Park. The uh, phases one and two uh, will be located on the southeast side of the tennis center. Um, the outdoor courts, there will be two full-size courts added uh, to the east end of some existing courts and uh, another full-size uh, court with six youth size courts in an area that is currently does not have any courts but due to the size of the youth courts there are 
three existing courts that are, will be demoed uh, to make way for uh, the youth courts. And again, as you see in the phase two, the, the uh, indoor uh, court facility. If you would please, next. Uh, that's a real overview of uh, the phase two, again, the outdoor courts. Uh, noting the demolition of the three existing courts for the construction of those uh, youth courts. Uh, phase two is really the building uh, for the six courts. There's a little leg um, going up to the, the existing path between the, the two courts in phases uh, one, and that is really a, a ramp and access to the rest of the facility because the courts are at a different elevation and so we're providing that that access to uh, the existing pathway uh, and we've got some renderings of um, the facility with the out outdoor courts the indoor courts uh, the view from the southwest uh, we've got a view from the, the southeast one thing that I did not mention, again, the building to the right is the existing senior center that's at the Real Rogers uh, Park. And then again, a better view of the outdoor courts uh, and uh, a view from the northwest of the building facility. Uh, the project budget and estimate for this project, um, right now the budget for phase one is uh, 520,000, uh, the phase two budget is uh, 2775000 for a total of uh, a little over $3 million. Our estimates for phase one is uh, the 519000 and our phase two uh, we're estimating at uh, 2.9 uh, with a total of uh, $3.4 and with the overage that's uh, shown in this estimate will be addressed with uh, within the design of the phase two project and uh, any uh, ad alternates that can be done uh, in, in the project to get within budget. If you recall, this is a unique project. Uh, Mark Allen, as you were, is, is, is generating half of the funds for this privately and the other half are generated by city funds. So we're uh, thankful for Mark and the efforts that he's put into this project. This is a uh, unique unique project for us. And that's really the, the intent of the, the phase one and phase two is the phase one is done by the, the funds from, um, from Mark Allen's effort and uh, the phase two would have the, the uh, matching city funds uh, att attached to that. Uh, so again, the project schedule uh, in February, we begin uh, the phase one construction again with, with the, uh, the donation or the, the private funding. And in May 2015, uh, the phase one construction will be complete. Uh, we're presenting, uh, again, the, the May preliminary report uh, in May of this year. And uh, in June of 2015, uh, completion of the phase two final plans. We have June of uh, 2015 for bid opening. And in July of 2015, the award of contract uh, uh, to begin construction. And uh, construction completion, uh, we're estimating at November in 2015. One other uh, added item to this project is uh, a, kind of a master plan that we did for the, the tennis center, and it was uh, proposed phase three, which is a new clubhouse. Um, if you can recall in the, in the site plan, the clubhouse was on the southwest corner, and you know the, the land that was available to uh, build the indoor courts facility was on the, the east and southeast side, so having somebody track from the clubhouse you know, was, was not really a, uh, benefiting anybody. And, and in phase three, we're proposing a clubhouse right against the, uh, or adjacent to the indoor facilities. And that would provide kind of a, a, another entry to those, uh, to that facility. Uh, and again, that's really kind of explaining where the existing clubhouse is at. And again, to get to the indoor courts, the, the travel path that they would have to take through the through the existing courts and down the ramp to the building. Uh, what's highlighted in red is the, the phase three, which is the clubhouse to, to house um, administrative area, a snack bar, a uh, you know, pro shop. And uh, again, the long leg to the left, again, in the master planning phase is a 
observation deck for those four courts that are to the north. So it adds another uh, level of interest to the people that, uh, uh, that come to see tournaments that can use that observation deck. But again, that's all in, in phase three. Any questions from the council? That's all we have this morning. Is, uh, is uh, phase three, is, is that, have, that doesn't have funding yet? That's correct, that is unfunded. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes, I guess, the, the discussions and the information on the uh, consent docket. We had a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please cast your votes. And the consent docket is approved. Concurrence docket. We have a motion and a second. Is there any individual consideration on the concurrence docket? Seeing none, please cast your votes. And the concurrence docket is adopted. Items requiring separate attention. We have some zoning cases. First one up is an ABC 2, uh, ABC 830, and Ward 3. Uh, Robert Sheets, Phillips Moore, on behalf of the owners, uh, address is 101 North Robinson, 13th floor, Oklahoma City, 73102. Um, it's, I believe it's been recommended by approval by the Planning Commission. It is a hotel, a home suites, our Homewood Suites. It's at Reno and Rockwell, approximately. And we're seeking a permit for beer, wine, and mixed beverage use. We have a motion to approve. Second. Second. Has anybody signed up? No. All right. Uh, cast, please cast your votes. And it's approved. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Next up is uh, ABC 831 and ABC 2 in Ward 6. Uh, is the applicant present? No applicant. Well, this is a uh, on uh, Southwest 29th Street uh, restaurant. Um, the application is to permit beer, wine, and mixed beverage sales to a new restaurant called Los Agaves. Um, Planning Commission recommended approval. There were no protests at the commission. And this is certainly an area that's got lots of um, restaurant activities. I would move approval. Second. The motion is second. Has anybody signed up? Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And it is approved. Next is uh, PUD 1569. Uh, in Ward 7, uh, the address is 1100 Northwest 192nd Street, going from PUD 435 uh, to PUD 1569. John? Uh, correction, Mr. Mayor. It's actually, even though it, on the agenda it says Ward 7, it's going to actually be in Ward 8, so I defer to my colleague. <laughs> All right, we'll take that. Uh, this is an ordinance on final hearing. Uh, it is actually in Ward 8. It's a mixed-use commercial development uh, I know the applicant is here today. There are no press protesters that I'm aware of. The applicant made efforts to meet uh, with some of the concerned neighbors and came up with a solution that included an eight foot tall fence with brick columns. Uh, and unless the, any of the council have questions, I'd move for approval of the item. Second. A motion is second. Any comments? Seeing them, please cast your votes. And it is approved. I will change our operation. Is this Ward 1? Yes, yeah, this is the right. yeah. <laughs> This is Trip the New Guy. Uh, PUD 1575, James. Yeah, uh, this is an area that's zoned AA, and uh, it's the, the PUD will have a base zoning of RA past the Planning Commission 7 1. Um, I feel like it's uh, compatible to the area. I know the Developers here, if you got any questions, but um, uh, I'll move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Please cast your votes. And it's approved. Thank you, James. Next up, Ward 8, Mark. Yes, sir. Uh, this is an ordinance on final hearing. It's for the uh, uh, additional uh, residential uses to, to be uh, performed at the existing airport called Sun, Sundance Airport. There is a representative here today for the applicant, but I would tell you that the Planning Commission approved this unanimously. There are no protesters at the Planning Commission, and I'm not aware of any protesters here today. 
So I would move for approval. Second. Approve motion is second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And is approved. And again, Ward 8. Huh? SPUD 816. I guess I'm on again. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to answer a question. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, this is an ordinance on final hearing. It's uh, for an assisted living uh, and memory care facility. It went before the Planning Commission. Uh, it was unanimously approved. There were no protesters at the Planning Commission, and I'm aware of no protesters here today, so I'd move for its approval. A motion is second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And it is approved. Uh, Item B is an ordinance on final hearing, uh, closing a platted utility in Ward 3. Uh, has anybody signed up? No. Uh, I move for approval. Please cast your votes. And it is approved. Next up is emergency f uh, to erect a telecommunication tower in the R1 single family residential district at 600 Southwest Grand Boulevard, Ward 4, Councilman White. Anybody signed up? I have, I have one question about this. Uh, it, uh, it, the reason that this needs a special permit is just because it's uh, not um, more than a half mile away from the other. Are, are we in a, do, do we, have we discussed whether or not that rule is even needed in, anymore or like that did, like what, what, what was the reason for that rule anyway? Well, the, Towers are uh, conditional use. If they m meet a set of conditions when right. it comes to separation, uh -huh. um, then they can be approved by staff administratively. Um, the distance requirement was one of the things that we looked at when we did the ordinance. We haven't re-looked at it on okay. the separation. I mean, we could we could do that if you Because I, I don't know when that ordinance was passed. And I think it you was. Know, I, I know that, you know, I think it was cell towers are increasingly needed and needed and needed because of mm -hmm increased uses, so I, I don't know if we need to relook at that distance or not. But just a thought. We had a motion to second. Did we not, Councilman White, on this? Second? Yep. Please cast your votes. And it is approved. Thank you, sir. Uh, item D1, public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak to any item on D1? Motion a second, and it is so ordered. Item E, public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Has anyone signed up? Anyone here to speak to any item under unsecured structures? If you would, sir, give us your name and address, and then tell us which item you'd like to speak to. Yes, sir. My name is David Miller. My address is 2815 Southwest 110th, Oklahoma City. And I'm here to speak in regard to number E. It'd be on E on public hearing regarding unsecured structures. We, I got that secured on Saturday, and I provided pictures. And then also, there, it backs up to an alley. And we cleaned up over 40 tires that have been dumped on us from that alley. And then uh, I think it's also on public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. And we got secured and we got the trash picked up then. I provided uh, a sheet of paper showing how much we paid to have it cleaned up and pictures showing that, that we'd secured the building and also removed the tires. As soon as we check that, we, by process, we clear it off. Okay, so. Thank you all. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Second. Motion to second. Please cast your votes. So done. Item F, abandoned buildings. Any other citizens would like to speak on item F? Let's see, we have a motion. The second, please cast your votes. Yes, so done. Item G, do we need executive session on this? No, no we do not. We have a motion to second. Anybody signed up? Please cast your votes. 
Item G is taken, approved. Item H, we do not need any action on this. That's correct. Okay. Move to strike, second. And item H is struck. Claims recommended for denial. Anybody signed up? We have a motion and a second. Just cast your votes. And item I is taken care of. Claims recommended for approval. We have three claims recommended for approval. The motion is second. We have a second. No signed up. Please cast your votes. And they are approved. Items from council. Mark, let's start with you, sir, if we could. I'd just briefly like to thank the uh, Northwest Oklahoma State Chamber for inviting me to their breakfast last Friday. I thoroughly enjoyed that group, very engaging and a, a very progressive group. Uh, secondly, last Wednesday, uh, I was invited to speak at the 30 Under 30 program, uh, and it was really encouraging to meet a, a lot of young, bright people who have chosen Oklahoma City to, to, to live and work, and so I want to thank them for that invitation. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. Uh, I, I received word that uh, test scores are definitely up uh, in our public school uh, system, so I look forward to getting those uh, test scores, hearing more about the test scores from Oklahoma City Public Schools and also the other public schools that we have uh, in the Oklahoma City area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Uh, a couple of quick things, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one is we've certainly had a robust conversation about uh, flooding today. <laughs> and uh, Pete, you're not alone down in Lightning Creek. Uh, David's office over at 4th and just by behind the Civic Center was flooded with all those properties at 4th and Francis, 4th and Walker. They're all sandbagged. Um, I attended a neighborhood meeting that uh, Friday evening. And I really just want, I wanted to thank Eric and um, Craig Keith for attending. They got blasted which you would expect. It was a fairly unpleasant hour. We're trying, I, I think the neighbors understand that we're trying, but we're, we're in an awkward time of change, and I think we're seeing more rain incidents than we ever have before, and um, it's, it's complicated. So um, I appreciate taking a look at these ordinances and seeing if we can maybe focus on redesigning capacity for what we seem to be experiencing. So I think that's a great idea. I wanted to congratulate uh, the Oklahoma City Public Schools Teacher of the Year from Star Spencer High School. Samantha Murch uh, was selected by the Foundation for the Oklahoma City Public Schools. So she's the drama, speech, and soccer coach at Star Spencer High School. And there were um, eight other fantastic candidates. Um, I think they had a very hard choice um, to make. And I just wanted to congratulate the Miller neighborhood. They had a very successful house tour on Sunday, as did Lincoln Terrace. So, thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I, I want to clarify something. I was not a part of that group that blasted our public works department Friday evening. <laughs> I understand the problems we all have here, and it actually helps when I go out to visit neighborhood associations. I can be more em empathetic uh, to their issues. But going back to our earlier discussion concerning uh, indirectly bicycling, a point, again, that I think really needs to be kept in mind, uh, I'm not suggesting we will have a MAPS for, but should the council ever decide to move forward with a, another MAPS initiative, what I'd like to see happen is that we take that idea of testing some of the ideas prior to the actual uh, implementation of any, any particular plan. Um, and again, the, uh, the uh, architect, Jeff Rism, really gave some great examples of how his firm was able to test ideas prior to implementation. And then secondly, if we can uh, ask for groups to be a part of that planning process, uh, such as ULI, and then the University of Oklahoma's uh, Institute for Quality Communities. I think it just uh, brings credibility and it also brings a perspective uh, that perhaps we've used them in the past, I'm not sure, but I would just encourage us to invite those two groups to any planning session if we were ever to uh, begin looking at a MAPS4 initiative. And final comment, you know, each time I go to these types of meetings, 
I uh, hear it more and more often, Oklahoma City should no longer try to compare itself with cities down in Texas. Uh, you know, 25 plus years ago, we would always compare ourselves with Tulsa. Well, we've certainly surpassed uh, that city, um, and we're surpassing uh, in many criterias uh, uh, cities down in Texas. We need to compare ourselves with the other world-class cities um, throughout the world. Thank you. Ed? Well, I'm really excited about a <clears throat> town hall meeting we're going to have this Thursday night at the Tower Hotel, which is right across from Baptist Integris Baptist Hospital. This Thursday night from 6.30 to 8.30, we have two national speakers coming in to talk about tax increment financing. One is Greg Leroy, who is the executive director of Good Jobs First in Washington, D.C. And the second is Pete Brzezinski, who owns and operates the a website called OKCTalk.com. Um, tax increment financing uh, has uh, its proponents and, and detractors, and there is a, a debate kind of raging throughout cities in America. The state of California has banned the practice. They're the ones who started it. Every state in America seems to have moved away from its original purpose of addressing blighted neighborhoods. We just had a Supreme Court case in Missouri where an affluent neighborhood argued that they were blighted because they didn't have a Nordstrom in a shopping mall, and they, incredibly, they won and uh, were able to use tax income and financing to finance the, the placement of a Nordstrom. So uh, this is not unique. The debate is not unique to Oklahoma City, and uh, there are a lot of similarities between Oklahoma City and, and cities throughout the country, and I think these speakers will be able to speak to both of that as to best practices and ways that we can improve. Talking to them and kind of reading over recently, my feeling is that the tax increment financing program in Oklahoma City needs comprehensive reform, not tweaking, but really top to bottom comprehensive reform. And uh, I think the time to have that discussion is urgent, and it's right now really for three reasons. One, we're talking about an incredible amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars. If we were to implement the, all the TIFs in the pipeline, Court Ashore, a TIF within a TIF for a convention center hotel, the Wheeler District, First National Center, and others, combine them with the nine that we've already created. You're talking about something very similar in size to MAPS 3, but without anything like the oversight of MAPS 3 with all its subcommittees and advisory panel, but hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. But what makes it so hard to predict is the long duration of 25 years. TIFs by statute can be zero to 25 years, and we always pick 25 years even though we're flying past the original authorized budget. The, the downtown TIF number two was created in the year 2000, 15 years ago, with an authorized budget of $47 million. We've flown past that. We've now collected twice that amount. And in another 10 years, we could hit three to 400 percent of that target number. But there's really never any public discussion about whether we should end the TIF. We just continue it, even though we're flying past our projected numbers. There's no telling how much development you would get in 25 years around a quarter shore park that you're using $130 million of, of public investment to get the development going. There's no way we can predict with, with something that long. Um, so we're talking about an enormous amount of money. The second reason to talk about it urgently is that my feeling is that nobody really understands it. There's only a handful of people in the city who really understand how this program works and who are operating it. And that starts with me. I don't understand it. And if, if, if people are looking to me to make policy, I don't have an adequate understanding of what's happening in other cities. I certainly haven't over the last four years. And I think it's very complicated. It's very difficult for me to understand. I struggle reading through it. And I need help. I need people from other cities uh, to explain to me what the best practices are, because I don't have enough information. I think the media, particularly the Oklahoman, consistently mischaracterizes tax increment financing constantly referring to that this is new development without pointing out that we're diverting money from existing buildings, existing property. Just inflation alone would, would cause an increment. Every time you sell a building, the property tax will increase. Appreciation, all those things haven't been talked about in the media. There's nothing on the, uh, there's no website that says how you, who and what qualifies for tax increment financing awards. There's nothing that says how much we've spent. 
There's nothing on our property, property tax bills, as they do in Chicago, that says exactly how much money is being diverted into TIF accounts. And what's painfully obvious is that the school board and those advocates for education clearly don't understand the process. That's very clear that the school board doesn't understand it, the superintendent doesn't understand it, the school board chair doesn't understand it. They still don't understand, even yesterday I was speaking with some of them, there's $12.5 million sitting in a bank account. It's been diverted, it's sitting in a bank account. They don't understand, is it for education or is it for all the taxing jurisdictions? It's been sitting there for years, they haven't drawn down on it, they haven't even known that it's there. Uh, can they spend it within the TIF district or out? How can you have $12.5 million in a bank account for education and nobody's drawing down on it because they don't even know it's there? I mean, that alone would be a red flag that something's wrong with the system. And that's the third reason to talk about it urgently is because education is where the bulk of the dollars are being diverted. More than 72% from public education, I-89 and Metro Tech and, and, and other education vehicles, uh, the bulk of it is education. And we talk in slogans. We're all, I think, very good, including myself, the chamber, about that we have this three-legged stool that education is an economic development driver, that we have to have an a skilled workforce, that good schools are a, a recruitment tool for corporations to come to Oklahoma City and that it's the key to neighborhood revitalization and an increase in our property values. We all say that, but then as when we, when we have edu economic development meetings and when we have economic development efforts, the school board's not there, the school advocates aren't part of the conversation. I don't think any of these TIF committees or any of the TIFs have ever met after they were originally created, except maybe for downtown uh, TIF number two. I don't even think they're meeting. Uh, I don't think they've ever met, except in the, in the very beginning. So um, getting them uh, brought up to speed and part of the negotiations about what these are going to look like in the future and bringing them to the economic development table, we either believe that they're an economic development tool or we don't. If we do, then we need to bring them into the conversation. And so that, that's why I believe this is very urgent. I think it's very timely. And I think everyone who attends on Thursday night we'll, we'll find it very, very impressive and the, the information very telling. Thanks. That's yes. the Tower Hotel across from Integris Hospital this Thursday night from 6.30 to 8.30. And there'll be lots of time at the end for questions from the audience. Councilman Griner, thank you, Councilman Shadid. Okay, a couple of quick things from Ward 3, if I might. Uh, past uh, Thursday night, uh, Councilman Pettis and I had the privilege of uh, attending the Neighborhood Alliance leadership graduation at uh, and now time for a cla uh, crass commercial for Ward 3 at one of our finest uh, gems, uh, Castle Falls Restaurant. The uh, leaders who had gone through Georgie's training uh, received their diploma and Georgie had challenged them at the beginning uh, to do something that had, I thought, profound impact and uh, very heartwarming to hear the, the stories. Every person who attended the seven-week session was told to pass on something to somebody else, an act of kindness or a project or something that would benefit that person. And then they were required to report back at the graduation what they had done. And the stories of the lives that were encouraged as a result of people just taking other neighbors' garbage cans uh, and taking them out in the morning and back in the evening uh, to help people out doing maintenance on houses and other acts of kindness was just a great thing. And so my hat's off to Georgie and the leaders for their participation in that. Uh, and then uh, also uh, this coming uh, week, uh, there is a neighborhood meeting, not, not in competition with the TIF, but the Windsor Forest is having a neighborhood meeting a Thursday evening. So if you're a member of that, choose whether you're going to go to Councilman Shadid's a symposium or your own neighborhood meeting, uh, but go to one or the other. And then uh, the Northwest Chamber of Commerce started, is starting a new uh, activity, Co uh, Coffee with the Councilman, patterned after South, the South Chambers. And uh, uh, Councilman Stonecipher came by and uh, met, met the fellow, people there, and they were very encouraged to see him come by, and they had a good dialogue afterwards on things that were going on in your city. So that concludes my uh, comments. Uh, we're now ready for citizens to be heard. We have somebody... comment about uh, something Councilman Shadid said about um, tax increment 
financing. You know, this may be too little too late, and I, I, and I fully appreciate that because I, I too share concerns about the way it operates, just the details, the down in, in digging down deep into it and finding out how the details work. But there has been a, um, a, a, dis a discussion a week ago yesterday. There was a discussion with the board members that I attended by uh, people from the Alliance and people, city employees and uh, attorneys that have something to do with it. And there's, been, there's a real effort, I believe, at this point to reach out to the I-89 and try to make them uh, more aware. It, is, it was very frightening to find out what they didn't know. And I would share that with, with you all. It was, uh, and there are lots of reasons for that. And I think the very the lowest ranking, if I was to rank all the reasons for it, would be, uh, would be, I would put blame on the board. I, I think there's a lot of reasons they don't know it, but it's not because they haven't been told. Um, I mean, it, 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 in a great deal, it is because they haven't been told. The opportunities have not been there. There's been no continuity in the communication system. But I think we're trying to fix that. I mean, this, the meeting that we had last a week ago yesterday was an extremely good meeting. It was a first meeting, intended to be a first meeting. Um, and I think, um, as, as uh, Ed says, they are the largest contributor of funds to the TIF. The, they are the single largest contributor. They, by themselves, I believe, contribute over 50% of the funds that go into the to the, that's available for TIFs, and and they ought to be at the table. They ought to understand it. Their board should understand it. They sh uh, and I think that was recognized. Uh, Kathy O'Connor was there, and I think right off the bat she she said that she recognized that there were deficiencies and in the communications, and we need to try to fix them. And I'm optimistic that that once the communication increases, um, we'll be able to determine. Um, with some specificity, the changes that uh, Ed alluded to without being specific about what the changes are, we'll know what those are. And I think some of them are coming out, some of them came out at the very first meeting. For example, um, the, some of the TIFs have geographic boundaries where I-89 can spend the money. And nobody now knows, understands why that ever was there. But it restrict, they have needs all over the district. The, the entire district suffers when they, re, when they have a reduction in total taxes. And, but there was restriction in the area they could spend the money. And so I think future TIFs will not have that restriction in them, which will be a, a, a really good deal for the district. Just one example. I and mean, that was right the very first thing that happened when that, that question was raised. And, that, and, and I think it's things like that will move us forward to have a better understanding of of if something needs to be done, what it is, rather than just kind of a shotgun approach to it. Uh, uh, I don't mean that's your approach, but I mean that's the approach if you just say we got to make changes. At some point you have to figure out what kind of changes you're talking about. And I think the, this series of meetings that we hope to have with the I-89's board and, and uh, uh, top administration um, will get us to that point. I think we're on a good path, really. And I think it's like everything else. The public has a right to know about it. I mean, and that, that, that lack of knowledge on the part of everybody concerned, me included, um, fosters a lot of beliefs that may or may not be right. Just if you don't know, well, you just, it's easy to jump to a conclusion, well, I don't know, and the reason I don't know is because somebody don't want me to know, and they don't want me to know because something else is happening, which none of that may be true at all. But until you know what, the, what it is that you don't know, it's hard to, to make good decisions. So, Just a quick comment also. I think the other thing that's important is it said there weren't any meetings with regard to TIF, but the TIF program is managed by our Economic Development Trust, and they meet every month. And anybody can come to any of those meetings, so um, there are lots of meetings. Well, I think, though, Meg, I really think that we, we have an obligation as public servants to make sure they know. The invitation of, of something as sophisticated as TIF financing, the invitation is to come on down, uh, doesn't work. I mean, we've got an obligation to make sure they understand. And I think that's, and that's what, the, and I agree that they could. And that's why I say the blame is hard to place about why they don't. But, but we, need to, we, just, we need to fix it. The fi pointing fingers about who did it and why that's done is really not going to be a good solution. 
Yeah, and I think part, part of the reason why Oklahoma City Public Schools has struggled because if you look uh, at the leadership with, within Oklahoma City Public Schools, they have changed uh, over a course of time um, because it, I know, for example, when the previous chair of the school district, she was very hands-on involved uh, for, for its TIF. So when that leadership changed, nobody, I guess it, it, nobody probably took the time out and said, hey, chair, this is exactly what's going on now. Uh, I can only talk about um, the, the TIF that I'm actively uh, involved in, but uh, at every TIF meeting that we have had, um, uh, Oklahoma City Public School District, had, they've been there. Um, but I think it's up to their staff to also go back and relay it, uh, not only to the superintendent, uh, but also uh, to their board. But I, again, I can only speak for us, uh, the, the, the TIF, uh, TIF District 9, but I think that part of that responsibility lies on uh, the, the designee of the school district to go back in and, and to report. Uh, in my TIF, for example, I do have Oklahoma City Public Schools, but I also have uh, Mickdale. And Mickdale has been very active uh, involved in uh, the Northeast uh, uh, TIF uh, uh, district. And a matter of fact, I can remember sitting down with uh, the superintendent of uh, Mid Middale, and, and, and she actually thanked us for coming in, talking to her, and explaining everything from A to Z. Because, for example, when Midwest City created their TIF, they didn't, they didn't work with the school district uh, uh, or whatever. That line of the communication wasn't there. Uh, so I think, uh, are, are, are there some things that need to be improved? Absolutely, yes. Um, but I think, to the school district, whoever their representative is on that TIF has to, the responsibility to go back and to report to the superintendent and to uh, the school board members. Um, for example, Metro Tech. Metro Tech uh, sends um, either one or two staff people uh, at the, for example, the Northeast uh, TIF district. It's a, I, I do believe that it's up to elected officials for us to communicate with other elected officials within those tax jurisdictions, but at the same time, whoever sits on the TIF review committee uh, has their responsibility to go back and report to their superintendent and also to their board. And I think that's some of the things that's being right. lacking. I don't think there's any question. I think in, in, uh, as a compliment to you, you're probably more involved in the actual workings of that TIF than any councilman is in any, of any other particular TIF. And the result of that has been that the, the other taxing entities probably know more about that one than they do some of the others. Uh, in the past, it, it's, it's, well, uh, we just, I, I, let, let's suffice it to say, I think we need to do a better job. And you're doing a good job with that one, and I, per, I personally appreciate it because I think that's what it takes to make it work. But um, the, the, other has, the others have not been operated quite that way. I, I appreciate what you're saying about communicating and talking to each other. I think you have to know what's going on in other cities, though, to have ideas to talk to each other about. And that's where Greg Leroy, I think, could help us this week. And I, and, uh, you have to know, for example, like restricting where the school spends their money. If we had, if we had a built-in mechanism for comparing ourselves to other cities, I don't think that would have happened uh, because we would have seen that other, they're not doing it that way. Uh, we would, if we study the duration, we might, we might change things. If we look at how other cities are doing things like payments in lieu of taxes as a way to minimize impact on schools, we might. But unless you know about those alternatives, you can't talk to the school, you can't negotiate or, or craft something different if you don't know what your different options are. And that's where I think the utility of looking at best practices in other cities really comes in and can help us. His plane lands at 12 noon on Thursday. He's, ha he's met with city councilors and school board members in cities across America. And he's happy to meet with anyone here. Uh, we'll get him to your office or wherever you are if you, if you want to meet with him. Uh, that Thursday afternoon before the town hall meeting. It, don't take it. Don't take a, anything no, no, I've not. said as a disparagement no, of what no, you're I'm doing because it's not that it. at all. But I, I think to some extent I, that you're, that's one facet of it. The other facet is we've got an obligation to do a better job of communicating ourselves and being communicate and demanding that we be communicated with. And I think that's I think that's happening. I think that's I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that um, 
that the, 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 the information deficit that the board has had, the school board has, is, is, is being closed rapidly. I know there's been a meeting since then, the, since the meeting a week ago Monday, there's been a meeting of staff that uh, they, they came away knowing a whole lot more about it than they do because it was a much smaller meeting. They were able to formulate questions ahead of time. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that we're on the right track. I'm not so sure that, that I don't agree with Ed that there are some dramatic changes need to be made, but that's, that's when we figure out what the dramatic changes are. And one of the ways to find that out is to listen to people that talk about it from other cities. So. Okay, moving along, if there's no further discussion, citizens to be heard. Uh, Joe Sarge Nelson. Oh, I'm Joe Sarge Nelson. Golly, I never had so much attention in my life. Uh, I've been coming here for two and a half years, almost three years, being the biggest bully the city all's ever had. And, uh, I very rarely give my word, and when I give it, I keep it. And my honor is just about everything I got. When I came being a bully all the time, I kept thinking, well, I was going to make things different, make things better. Just because I read something in the paper about what one of you all did, what you didn't do, the rails, everything about the MAPS project. I'm one person. There's thousands of us out here. I may not agree with you, but being a bully doesn't change a thing. It just makes you a bigger ass than you were when you walked in. Excuse the expression, ladies. And that's what I became. Well, Mr. McAtee and Mr. Pettis was at this organization where I found out where I live. I live out in Mr. McAtee's area at Granada Village. It's a privately owned outfit. We have 300 lots out there, and the only way you can live here, you have to own your own home. And that's a mobile home, by the way. I've lived there for 10 years, and I've seen things come and go, and I kept saying, well, maybe I'll go down to the city and see what I can get done. <laughs> well, when you bully people, you're, they're going to hear you, but they don't hear you. That's the way you don't get things done. Well, I was invited to go to a class, and I thought, oh, here I go at 77 years old. I'm going to go to school. So I go down to Metro Tech on Bryant, <laughs> and I met the lady, Reggie. I call her Reggie, for the better word. Three hours and the very first night, she laid the plan out. She said, it like he said, you go to all these classes, but at the end of the class, at the end of the thing at graduation, put together a plan of what you've done for somebody else. To make a difference. Well, if you went through seven of the nine of these courses, of which Mr. McAtee was at one, Mr. Pettis was at there twice. In fact, he gave me kind of an ovation <laughs> that one night. Uh, but anyway, to make a long story short, I know you're all busy. I owe you all an apology. Mr. Grenier, Mr. Sadib, Pete, Mr. Jordan I've spoke to, and Mr. Couch most assuredly, I asked you to resign, which was the biggest mistake I ever made. You can only be a fool so many times in your life, and sooner or later you've got to address yourself in that mirror. And boy, it slaps harder than most people hit you. And Mr. McAtee, I always wanted him to smile, but even when he's in a joyous mood, he had his lovely wife there the other night. Saturday night was the biggest night I've ever had. I got a little piece of paper from the Neighborhood Alliance, you all, you'd have to understand, I fought everything I fought for, for my family. I'm the lonely son. I'm 77 years old. <laughs> I've accomplished not a damn thing. Nothing. My mother and dad's gone now. I've been a uh, Navy man, Mr. David gave us a little credentials here some while back. I'm the smallest Navy SEAL in history. I retired in 1975, not from the military, but uh, from wounds in action and naturally from the Social Security. But I want to apologize to you 
I shook your hand when you came aboard. I attacked you for no reason. And I attacked you generally. And I've even had my few remarks about Mrs. Kersey, which was long over under the belt. And Mr. McAtee, you never did smile, but then again, everybody has their nature. There's something inside of everybody. And Mr. Couch, believe it or not, I do really care about this council. There's eight of you. You come from all different walks of life. You come, all, your, all the communities are all different. You have to live with a lot of different people. You deal with the situations the best you can with what tools you've got. We're not millionaires. And you, you can't pay everything. It's just like going home. You've got to pay your bills. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. Mr. Jordan, I owe you an apology. I've seen you a few times walking. And I meet me and Pete. Got like acquainted pretty good over at Civic Center walking across the city hall one day. And Mr. Steve and I got pretty well acquainted. One, he is my doctor in reality. I haven't seen him in a while. I haven't been sick along that line. I've been sick elsewhere. Uh, and besides up here. And Jim, it, it's, it's been great watching y'all come aboard. The only time you'll ever see me here again is to either sit in and listen or fight a fight that really needs fighting. But you'll already be fighting it to begin with. I'd like to be part of the team rather than be against it. And uh, you have my deepest respect. Glad to have you aboard. And uh, it's a hard job, but you'll get there. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll bid you adieu. Have a good day. Thank you, Joe Sarge. Any other citizens to be heard? Hearing none, we are adjourned.